Good morning, everyone, and welcome into the Hear Sports Podcast Show. I'm Kyle Newman, your host. And I'm Rod Hensley, your co-host. On this show, anything sports goes, whether professional, college, or even high school. Debate is highly likely, laughter is always encouraged, good times is a given, and hashtag great sports talk will be a reoccurring theme. Today, we will talk about the top five quarterbacks in the NFL, the PGA Tour, anchored putters Rory McIlroy and Jordan Spieth, Christian Leitner, and the NBA Draft. Rhett Hensley, we're on our sixth show. We're a month and a half in. How are you doing this morning, buddy? Oh, I'm doing just peachy. I'm hanging in there. I'm ready to see you tonight. Me too. Coming down to the old stomping grounds of the heart of the bluegrass here in Bowling Green. You're going to come visit me for a week. It's going to be great. We happen to not get the show in on time to do it together, but the Pacers show we will. Oh, yeah. Looking forward to it. Me too. And I'm looking forward to this show because we've got a lot to talk about. So we're going to get right into it. And, Red, I have a feeling we're going to have a little disparity on this first one. The Mm -hmm. top five quarterbacks in the NFL. Let's count down from five to one. And we'll talk. Go ahead. We'll talk a little bit about what. Oh, you you want me to go first? Yeah, we've got to switch it up. You know, I'm always the one that's going first. Okay. And I think it's time for you. That's fine. All righty. I have no problem going first. My number five is none other than the legend he was in Indianapolis, and that is Peyton Manning. Fifth on the list, let's face it, this this man man last year was fourth in the league in passing yards, 4,700, all right? He still had 39 touchdowns and 15 picks. That's impressive for a guy who's not getting any younger and got injured last year, too. Carries this Broncos team. Uh, It's still lethal as can be. Um, Boy, did I love him his years in Indianapolis. But as a Bronco, he's still getting it done. He's not going to retire. He's going to come back. I think he he has just as many weapons around him. He makes everyone better. He will end up being the fifth best quarterback in the NFL this next year, in my opinion. And that just goes to show you how loaded – the quarter the league, the league is with quarterbacks that I have him at number five, but I do. Peyton Manning is my number five. Rhett, who is your number five? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna give it to you. I'm gonna give it to you hard. You ready for this one? Yeah, I am. Andrew Luck. I saw it coming. Disrespectful. All right, you know, go ahead. You know, I'm gonna give you a great reason why. So you know you have to listen to the whole spiel. First of all, passer rating ninety six point five. You know he's not, not bad. You know I I do see the the improvement each year, which is great. Um, he had sixteen interceptions. He threw for four thousand seven hundred sixty one yards, forty TDs. Good for you know in the league. Good for first in the league. Yes. So here's what I'm thinking right here. You know, if as as the the guy. Elliot Harrison said if he hung up his jersey today, he would not be a Hall of Famer. It's his fourth year in. Well, I'd hope not. (laughs) Exactly. Well, I'd hope so, but I mean in four years, three completed years, no. Now, as I'm saying after this season – you know he's gonna he's gonna jump up there. He's somebody that can he can take over this league by storm. That he's just gotta. Already you know has. he has he. We huh. disagree. <laughs> he has one of the some of the best wide receivers in the league on his team. You know, just like the Cowboys, <laughs> and you know he can be amazing. And I'm I'm letting you know that now, Kyle. Number five, if we had the same question next year, he'd more than likely be my number two. Well, I appreciate some respect, even though I think it's completely disrespectful. And, and quite honestly, uh, it's not, next. not the same with a lot of, which I'll get to in a tad, just not the same with a lot of the NFL experts' top five, which I find a little interesting. But nonetheless, my number four... It's none other than 
Thank you, Tony thank you. you know, for the Dallas Cowboys. Did I have to put him in the top five? Yes, I did. Even though I will, it is worth mentioning, Rhett, that he did not even make a few of the experts' top ten, which I found a little surprising, quite honestly. Disrespectful. As much as I can't stand the Cowboys, I'm going to have to give a little respect to the quarterback that he is, and I'm surprised. I, I certainly – I have him at four in the top five. I'm surprised he wasn't even in the top ten in a lot of the NFL experts' picks for this next year. Uh, let's face it, Tony Romo is a phenomenal regular season quarterback. And because he had good regular season numbers, Tony Romo has to be in there. But that's just it. He hasn't proven himself in the playoffs yet. Even though last year they advanced one round, they still did not he still did not prove that they could get them over the hump and get past the divisional. Let's but for as far as regular season goes, he's as he's as lethal as they come. He has them uh, with a, a great offense every single year. 3,700 yards, was good for 14th in the league last year, not flashy with yards, but he had 34 touchdowns to nine picks. That's an impressive ratio right there, and he had a great quarterback rating. So um, Tony Romo, I believe, has to be in the top five. I have him at four, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that you look, you look with the fact that they had DeMarco Murray – at running back last year, who was carrying a lot of load. They had a very balanced offense. So Tony Romo, I believe, is a is a number four quarterback coming up this year, Red. I like it, Kyle. You know, I as I was, you know, I'm going to go ahead and give you my number four. Uh, these two were about to be, I, I kept swip, switching them back and forth. I could not make up my mind on this one, but, you know, I had to go with my man Tony Romo as my number four. Oh, uh, we have one that's the same. Yes, it was. I tell you what, I had it started out as Andrew Luck, and then I had, then I switched to Romo, and then I switched it back to Luck. So and you then had I some bias. Back... Okay, I can understand bias with it. Well, I wouldn't say bias. You know, I was looking to, you know, attempts to completion ratio. You know, I was looking at you, you know touchdown analyzer. interceptions. Um, you passer rating, you know, I just had to go with my boy Romo, you know, he, he threw for 3,705 yards, which that's a little low, but you also got to think you had the, the, the bad man in the backfield, DeMarco Murray. He had to share the spotlight, 34 touchdowns. Uh, you know, he's a great, he has great mobility in the pocket. He is one of the best in the pocket. Um, you know, he's got a great offensive line. So into this upcoming season, he, he's going to really, honestly, he's going to be able to build a campfire and sit around the campfire once he snaps that ball. So, you know, I, I have, he's going to be able to find somebody to get open. He's going to, this is going to be his best season yet this upcoming season. Well, I hope not, but I hope so. I can I, I can obviously respect it because we both are at number four there with him. That's, that's pretty impressive. Uh, not a terrible start, except uh, just the disrespect to begin with. All right, <laughs> so my number three is a man that I can't stand, maybe even more than Tony Romo and the Cowboys, and that is Tom Brady. Oh. Uh, Tom Brady was 10th in the league last year in passing yards, 4,109. He had 33 touchdowns to nine picks, just as impressive as Romo. Uh, 97 quarterback rating. Um Let's face it, he's a, he's a phenomenal quarterback. He won the Super Bowl again last year. So how can the man not be put in the top five? Every single year he just seems to be able to get it done. However, he's a cheater. And uh, he also lost some key players on that team and is suspended for the first four games. So though I think he's in the top five, I have him at number three. Uh, I, if, if that suspension holds up, which the, every indication shows it will as of right now, I, I don't think that he will have maybe even top five numbers because of missing four games. But I think he'll still be a top five quarterback because I think he's going to do what he does with the Patriots, unfortunately. He's going to get them to the playoffs, and he's going to take them deep because that's what he does. He's a great quarterback, Hall of Famer. 
So he absolutely has to be in the top five for the best quarterbacks in the league because when everyone thinks of the best quarterbacks in the league, his name is going to be mentioned. I have him at number three, though. All right, well, Kyle, I am glad you didn't make any deflate jokes because it would be really bad to pump this segment up. (laughs) I like it. Puns always intended. Nicely done. (laughs) Thank you, thank you. Pump it up, pump it up. There you go. I'm going to give you my number three, and that is Ben Roethlisberger. Mm, Not a fan of him. Not a fan of him. But he killed it last year. He killed it last year. Passer rating of 103.3, nine interceptions, 4,952 yards he passed for, 32 touchdowns, and he is just as good in the pocket as Tony Romo. He has two Super Bowls. He had an outstanding year this year, and he's a little underrated when it comes to that. Okay. You know, you know what? I can respect that, but you're going to be surprised that he is not in there for me. And that, and I went di- I went different from what the experts picked, and here's why. I'm going to comment on that because he's not in there for me. Yes, he was tied for first last year. In yards at 49.52. Yes, he had a 32 touchdown and 9 interception ratio. Yes, he had a 103 quarterback rating. But, as far as this next year, I have to look at Ben Roethlisberger getting older. That Steelers team is just not very good. They do not have very many weapons anymore, and they are getting older. And so I'm looking at it like that. He carried the load for them last year. He's a phenomenal quarterback. He is a two-time Super Bowl champion. He is tough as nails and hard to bring down and extends the plays. He is exciting to watch. There is no doubt about that. I just don't see those same type of numbers this next year, and it goes to show how deep this quarterback class is. I don't see him being in the top five. I'd put him in the top ten probably, but it just has to do with the weapons and him getting older, and he also has a problem staying healthy. So – I just don't see Ben Roethlisberger being in the top five this next year, so he's definitely uh, not in there for me. But I can respect you putting him there at number three. It would be hard to disagree with it. Exactly. My number two is none other than my boy Andrew Luck, number 12, for the Indianapolis Colts. And he is number 12 for the simple fact of improving every year. He He has taken the league by storm. And everyone is starting to give him that respect. 4,761 passing yards last year, good for third in the league. 40 touchdowns, good for the most in the league. 16 interceptions, a little bit high. I'd like to see him cut those down, but it's because he's not afraid to go for it all and extends the play. He believes he can make any throw, which he can. He's a Bubba Watson. He is a Bubba Watson. Bubba Way. 96.5 quarterback rating, not terrible. Again, it's not all the passing game in Indianapolis. We now have a running game. 298 yards passing a game, pretty impressive, and 380 completions. Not terrible. Uh, the biggest thing with for Andrew Luck with me is his scrambling ability. This man may be one of the quickest quarterbacks and with the biggest body at 6'4", 240. Uh, he's a locomotive. He's exciting to watch as he extends those plays. Absolutely. Rushing touchdowns, you can count on them each year for him. Rushing yards uh, to maybe have at least one game where he rushes more than the running back. Uh, that's Andrew Luck. And not to mention the the records that this man keeps breaking. Last year, actually we'll go through his career. He has – he th- this, this is it's just amazing to me in his career – And these are all historical records now. Nine fourth-quarter comebacks, 12 game-winning drives. The man is clutch. And clutch puts you at number two in the top five in the NFL for quarterbacks, if you ask me. Now the next step to bring him over that hump is to advance one more year, and that's to the Super Bowl, which I predict that they will, and to get that, that ring. But... The, he just keeps breaking records, broke, broke the rookie records. Like I said, the fourth quarter comebacks, game-winning drives. There's nothing he can't do. There's nothing he he doesn't accomplish at this point in three years in the NFL. It's just it's incredible. Andrew Luck, number two, keep it going. I, I like it. You know, it's not it, it's not bad, but I, we just kind of went in the opposite direction here. 
You know? Just a tad. It, it's respectful. I, I can see that next year. That's what more than likely I would have. I, right. I would respect it. He will be a better quarterback than Romo is and will be. So, well, I appreciate moving the on. Respect. No problem. But who is my, your number my next two? pick? You know, I like him. You hate him. Oh boy, Tom Brady. Oh my gosh, I can't believe you like him. You know, I, I just feel like I can relate to, relate to him more. You know, I, we kind of got that pretty boy type of feel to <laughs> us. We 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 feel entitled. You know, oh, we just got that little got the little connection. I'm a, I'm gonna text him after this and tell him I put him on my number two. You know, me and him <laughs> tight, but yeah. You know, he he didn't he didn't have the you know the best passer rating better than Andrew Luck. Parentheses. <laughs> um, wow. He had ninety seven point four uh, nine interceptions, threw for four thousand one hundred and nine yards. He took him to the championship though, and he won. He came in clutch when he needed it in the playoffs. He killed it. You know. That in my eyes, when he when he was needed by that team, he did them well, and that's just impressive to me. Well, I can respect it, even though I can't stand him. Like I said, I mean, I had him at my number three. Yeah, we were one uh, away, close. But basically, yeah, the the thing that that really affects those that passer rating is the interceptions. The interceptions is what really takes down. Uh, that rating, um, but again, the the plead for my boy Andrew Luck is he has to carry this team, and yeah, he's and that's, not afraid to make any pass. That's, that's the thing. Next year, I think I I will see him being in the hundreds, Andrew Luck, because you know people are not going to be able to predict his game. Well, it's not going to have that. That's another thing I should have mentioned. This next year, he will be over a hundred quarterback rating, and the simple fact of the matter is because they're going to have the best offense in the league, not just because of him because of the offensive weapons that they brought in. The running game, they now are going to have the most balanced running game they've had since Edger and James. It's going to be impressive, and the load will be taken off Andrew Luck finally. And so that's another reason where, you know, number two for me, uh, it's really a no-brainer. He's doing nothing but improving. Um, but you have you have uh, Tom Brady at number two? Okay, well, I can understand it. I think that we're going to be uh, on the same page on number one. I have a feeling, and I'm quite honestly, I'm surprised on a lot of analysts that this man was not number one. It's uh, pretty disrespectful in my eyes. If if he's not clutch as can be, maybe it's because of what he's done. But my number one is the bad man, Aaron Rodgers. Aaron oh, Aaron Rodgers is the number one quarterback in the NFL. Uh even though his numbers don't necessarily show it, he is absolutely clutch as can be and accurate. Listen to this. This is just impressive. He was seventh in the league last year in yards, 43-81. All right? He had 38 touchdowns, good for third most, and he had five interceptions. The man is absolutely accurate. He takes care of the ball, not to mention – how about his 112.2 quarterback rating? Good for the best in the NFL. He is absolutely a beast. He is reliable. He is clutch. He can. He is the strongest arm in the NFL. He can make any throw as well. Uh, and he also has to lead this Packers team because they have an injured running game all the time, and he has to carry the load for them. He can scramble, um, and he's had some trouble with health. Uh, he's a he's a one time Super Bowl champion will be another Super Bowl in his future. I see that. Uh, he's the best quarterback in the NFL, and I, I don't think a lot of people would argue with that. That's how that's how deep the court, the league is with quarterbacks, the fact that you can switch so many players uh, based on stats, based on what he's already accomplished, based on you know his regular season. Uh, Aaron Rodgers is the best quarterback in the NFL in my mind. All and, right. All right, well, I'll give you my number one. And that is Philip Rivers. Philip Rivers. That is funny. <laughs> but if that was true. All right, then... I'm a, we have the same one, Kyle. Mine's Aaron Rodgers. You know, you know, I, I think that in my mind his numbers spoke out to me this year. 
passer rating of 112.2, five interceptions, Mm -hmm. 4,381 yards, 38 TDs, MVP of the league this year. And let's face it, they should have been in the Super Bowl. And it was not because of him that they weren't, that they blew that against the Seahawks. It should have been the Packers in the Super Bowl. Oh, they shouldn't have been there in the first place. Yeah, yeah, I knew he was going there with yeah. that. But don't let, even but, give me that, man. But that's don't that, even. That's the Packers and and Aaron Rodgers. It's it's so impressive. I mean, I'd like to see the last time that a quarterback went the whole regular season only throwing five interceptions, not just regular se- whole season, throwing five interceptions and having a one twelve quarterback rating. It's unheard of. The man is clutch and. Yes, um, has had plenty of game-winning drives himself. It's uh, it's a no-brainer for me. So, Rhett, there's our top five. I'm surprised we had more that were the same or close to the same than I thought we did. Um, you know what's I will I will mention this one guy we didn't mention who was tied for first in the league with passing yards was Mr. Drew Brees, and I love me some Drew Brees. Uh, but here's why I didn't have him in there. Um, they just lost Jimmy Graham. And he was their his number one target, and and he had to carry the load again for this Saints team, and they didn't even make the playoffs. So when I look at top five best quarterbacks, I also have to look at not only predicting what will happen this next year, uh, and he's getting older, but I have to prig I have to predict based on what does he do carrying the team, and he didn't carry that team even to the playoffs. Um, and I and to me, a top five quarterback has got to be doing something for that team. You know, uh, and quite honestly, you know, the fact that he he threw a lot of interceptions, uh, I believe, up there for the most in his career in a season. Uh, Also, he just he didn't have many game winning drives. I don't even know if he had one game winning drive last year, Uh, but he he didn't get that team as many W's as he needed to. So that's why he wasn't in my top five rep. What about you? Well, you know, he was he was potentially going to be in my my top five but you know he as you said he had some he's he's lost some people he didn't he threw for quite a bit of yards but he also had a lot of turnovers and you know there was better players out there that I saw that had a better season than him so I just couldn't put him in there Ben Roethlisberger was that I I had Breeze in there then I took him out and well, Ben Roethlisberger how deep it is. deserved it a lot more, in my opinion, than that. And so, he did get his team to the playoffs. Yeah, and, so you know, you know, playoffs are kind of big. Yeah, they are. It's impressive, and, and and it just goes to show how deep again the quarterback class is. And and I'll mention it again, Rhett, before we get to this next segment. Here, here's a John Clayton, probably. Probably the most NFL insight as an analyst. Very good at predicting the quarterbacks uh, in this league. He, along with Gruden. I love how Gruden does it. There's a lot of other guys. But his stood out to me. He was factoring in age and, and projected decline and the stats from the past few years. Here was his upcoming top five quarterbacks this year. Uh, number one, Aaron Rodgers. Number two, Tom Brady. Number three, Andrew Luck. Kind of sounding a lot like Rhett's right now. Uh, number four, Ben Roethlisberger. Number five, Peyton Manning. And uh, whose was this? This was John Clayton's. So he <laughs> didn't even have – and then it went Breeze at six, Philip Rivers at seven, Russell Wilson at eight, wow. Matt Ryan at nine, and Joe Flacco and, and Eli Manning at ten and eleven. He didn't even have Tony Romo – in the top 15. find that very disrespectful. Last year. Now, he did go on to change it the next year. He, he did a next pre, next year project, projecting. This kind of follows your line of reasoning with Luck. 2016, Aaron Rodgers number one, Andrew Luck number two, Tom Brady number three, Ben Roethlisberger number four, Drew Brees at number five, and again, Tony Romo doesn't even crack the top ten. In his, I'm a little surprised on that, but he's not the only one. There were several other analysts who did not even have Tony Romo in the top ten, but the top three were pretty across the board um, the same. Rodgers, Luck, Roethlisberger, or vice versa. Um, 
and Tom Brady in there. So, Rhett, what do you think about that? The analysts not necessarily agreeing with us. I think that's disrespectful. Agreed with you yep. for the most part, though. Yeah, I mean, first of all, Tony Romo had an outstanding year. You got to give credit when credit's due. Yeah, he, he could have threw for a lot more than that, but they ba- they had a very balanced offense this year, and. It sounds you know, like they're projecting that off of the decline, uh, thinking but, that he's getting but, older and they just lost DeMarco Murray. And... you gotta you got to get past the DeMarco Murray thing in this situation. They had the best offensive line, more than likely, in the NFL this year and possibly in lifetime. So, in the lifetime of the Cowboys. Huh. So, you know, it, it's just disrespectful. He's, he's going to have another great season. And just disrespectful. Well, I I can't say I agree with him completely, especially when it comes to Tony Romo being in there. That that Uh, fellow needs to chiggity check himself before he wrecks himself. But other than that, I I, I can pretty much agree. A lot of the other ones are similar. So besides him not having Tony Romo in the top five, let alone the top ten or even top 15, uh, I I can agree with about every other one. Well, Rhett? The top five, there you go. A little surprise. We we were closer than I thought we would be, but then again, we had some disparity. So I guess it's a given. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, let's get into this next segment. This is going to be interesting. I've been looking forward to this one. We're going to talk about the PGA Tour and the several different things. And we're going to start, Rhett, with the anchored putter rule change. And this is not what I had thought it was at first. At first, I thought they were banning the belly putters, which you and I are both not fans of. But it's yeah. not true. They're banning anchoring putters, and they meaning the belly putters, but you can't anchor it to your body. Um, and basically, it's because they, a lot of players and the officials believe it gives an unfair advantage for control to players that do that. But listen to this. Um, basically... The governing bodies, this was a couple of years ago that they decided to do this rule change. They're banning the anchoring club, um, and it's going to be effective starting January 1st of 2016 uh, for this next golf year. Basically, players who use belly putters or long putters will no longer be able to hold the butt end of the club against their bodies while making a stroke, although the clubs will still be allowed provided they are not anchored. And what's interesting about this, four of the past six major championship winners, again, this was a couple years ago, but four of the past six major championship winners, including Adam Scott, used the anchored stroke. Um, So basically, this rule change, they say, protects one of the important challenges in the game, the free swing of the entire club. The traditional stroke involves swinging the club with both the club and gripping hands held away from the body, requiring the player to direct and control the movement of the entire club. Uh, Basically, anchoring is different. Intentionally securing one end of the club against the body and creating a point of physical attachment around which the club is swung is a substantial departure from that traditional free swing. Rhett, what do you think about this rule change? Um, you know, I, I, I kind of like, I kind of agree with this. Um, you know, I think that the, the, you know, the belly putters can still give an advantage, even though if you don't have it to your, have it attached to your like stomach area or your chest for control, I think, still think it gives you a lot more control than the regular putter. But, you know, I think it's a good, it's a step in the right direction. Yeah, uh, I'm not a fan of them. That's for sure. No, I agree. I, I agree with this rule change. I like it. I agree with everything that the those uh, officials said about it. I think it creates an unfair advantage. I think it takes away from the tradition of the game. Plus, I hate seeing them. Man, yeah. are they ugly. And and They're we, annoying, you but... and I both know we're both fans of traditional. I like that traditional straight edge, straight bar, putter. Yeah. Uh, and and I think that it 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 is right for the game with the tradition and the challenge that it gives. And I'd like to see, I'd like to see the belly putters banned completely. But yeah, I, think I would this, too. This, I think this anchored rule is a step in the right direction for sure. Uh, exactly. I think it'll create players to maybe go away from it because who's going to want to hold that long putter that's as tall as them out in front of them now? Uh, yeah. it, I think that'll make it harder for them. But Rhett, I think that we agree with that uh, tradition, baby. Yeah, we like traditional stuff. Exactly. That's for sure. 
Exactly. Other players that were major winners that won it, Keegan Bradley, Webb Simpson, Ernie Els, they all use the anchor putter. Um, and, and basically they feel they have a different method of putting. They think it's not cheating. Uh, they think they should have the choice to do what they want with it, uh, being professionals. And though that may be hard to argue with, uh, the rules are the rules. Yeah, and I mean, it's part of the game, the tradition. You can think of it as everybody can use that type of putter if you want, but yeah. if you're going to per- play professionally, um, you know there are rules that you have to follow. And exactly. you know, traditional is something that you know I think that needs to be kept in sports. I like the traditional feel. Most most people are going away from traditional, but I think it needs to be stuck around, sticking around for quite some time. Yeah, no, I agree with that, and here's the thing about it, Rhett. With that tradition and with with the rule change comes, you know, with their argument about it uh, being they have the right. No, because there's rules, just like in any other professional sport or sport in general. And or if, any and if, and if, you, if work what you're doing gives you an unfair advantage, that's cheating, and yeah. the rule has to be changed. It's the same reason why they, on tour they don't allow a 460 cc big head driver, yeah. because you'd hit the ball 500 yards. I mean, there's yeah. reasons for these rules, and it's no different with a putter. And I think they just need to be banned completely. And I think it go, it's going that way. But I like the step in the right direction that the PGA is taking with this. And I hope uh, I hope that it uh, it creates um, some more fairness now. And quite honestly. Uh, I'd like to see these players go back to that old traditional putter, and we'll see just how used they got to the to the anchored putters, because yeah. uh, it, it will be quite an adjustment uh, to to switch back to it. But they better start now, because it, yeah. it's heading that way. But Rhett, that was just a quick rule change that they have with it. I wanted to talk with you about because it it's interesting, and we both had had mentioned that quite often, and we both love the game of golf. Uh, in fact, we're going to be playing <laughs> quite a bit of golf ourselves this uh, Preferably this, tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. And Thursday. Basically, we love golf, folks, and uh, and, and we're going to get out there on the links, and we're going to play it, and, and we're going to play traditionally. We're going to play yes. by the rules uh, because that's what we love, and we know and love exactly. it. Exactly. And, and I'm taking Kyle's money. And I'm coming for Red and keeping my money and taking his. So th- yeah. this is going to be uh, a, a nice, friendly wager that we'll have going, and it's going to be interesting. Uh, but basically, Rhett, the next thing I wanted to get to is, as far as the PGA goes is your boy Rory McIlroy and our uh, and the upcoming boy that we both love, Jordan Spieth. I got a question for you. I want to get yes. into a little debate here on this. This is interesting. Rory McIlroy or Jordan Spieth, at the end of their careers, who – has a better career in your mind? You know, that's kind of a tricky one. Um, I know. I know it is. It's it's because, you know, golf is such an up-and-down sport. It's like a Christmas tree, um, <laughs> as you'd say, Kyle. you loving that saying, aren't you? It's an interesting one. It's like a Christmas tree. It goes up, and then it goes down. That's right. And all around. Like a carousel. Like a carousel. So you put the quarter in. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we we can't ever have a day without a Happy Gilmore reference, folks. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But you know, it's you know Rory's having a, he's having a tough time right now. You know the U.S. Open was a very hard course. Um, it was. Jordan Spieth he just played very very well, and you know I think that at the end of the day I think they're going to be close together. Um, I I can't give a definite answer on who I think is going to be better because I'm torn. That's for sure. But I can tell you right now that it's going to be a close, close career that they have. All right. Well, we'll talk about it a little more, and then I'm going to have to get your prediction with it. But I'll, I'll chime in a little bit here. I did get my prediction. Before I give my prediction. No, i got to hear. you got to tell me who. Uh, but basically, before we do that, I'll talk a little bit about it from my standpoint. They're both phenomenal players. Uh, they really are. I respect both of them. I would say that both players are in my top ten of favorite golfers. I'd put probably Jordan Spieth in my top five. I wouldn't have Rory in my top five, um, but he would be in my top ten. But here's the thing. 
both are having great years, but Jordan Spieth is having the greatest year right now. Rory McIlroy's year was last year. Uh, this year, it's been all Jordan Spieth, but, but Rory McIlroy hasn't had a bad one. He's played in eight events this year. He's won two tournaments. He's finished six and he's had six top ten finishes. Uh, only cut once. He's fifth in the sta- FedEx Cup standings. Uh, I believe he's down to third in the world now in the world in the world rankings. Um, but that's still impressive. And then you look at Jordan Spieth on the other end. Jordan Spieth has played in 17 events this year. He's won three tournaments. How about including the first two majors of the year? The Masters and the U.S. Open. Um, he has had three second-place finishes, one third-place finish, and ten top-ten finishes. Only cut twice. He's first in the FedEx Cup standings this year. He's also first in the world the world ranking um, right now. So both having phenomenal careers, Rhett. It's hard to put it past him. Rory McIlroy struggling a bit, but then again, he, not terrible based on those stats I just said. Uh and here's the thing. When you look at Jordan Spieth so far, and, and that's why it's interesting to think about the end of their careers. You know, right now, Rory has the edge up as far as what he's accomplished so far. He's been in the league longer, yes. Um, he's been on tour longer. But let's face it. He has, Rhett, 18 professional tournament wins since he turned professional in 2007. 11 on the PGA Tour, 11 uh, on the European Tour, and then a couple other on the other tours, all right? He has four majors already. That's impressive. He's won the – he's came – the only one that he has not won is the Masters. He came in fourth in this past year, uh, this past year's Master. Uh, but he's won the U.S. Open. He's won the British Open, and he's won – Twice at the PGA Championship, the one that we went to last year, Rhett, that you put some money down on him. So he has four majors already, which is impressive to Rory McIlroy. He has four majors compared to Jordan Spieth's two so far in his early career. Uh, Basically, Jordan Spieth joined the tour in 2012. So let's face it, the man's only three years in. That's what's impressive about Jordan Spieth. Um, but he's promising. He's got six tour wins uh, and has the two majors, the Masters and the U.S. Open this year. So, Rhett, it's hard to put it past both of these guys. You know, Jordan Spieth younger, and he's coming up, but Rory McIlroy's already, you know, plenty established uh, with his with already his majors and, and his tournament wins. He, he He's going to come on strong. He's the youngest can be as well. Has a long time to go. So, here's the, here's what I'm going to have to predict. I'm going to have to predict that when it's all said and done, Rory McIlroy will have more accomplishments than Jordan Spieth at the end of his career. Uh, he'll have more Masters. He will have more PGA Tour wins. But I'm going to say Jordan Spieth isn't going to be far behind. I just see it more in Rory McIlroy. I see him being more of a Tiger Woods dominant. He can hit it like he can. When he gets going, he runs away from the competition. And I just I think that with him it's mental. I think it's mental right now. He's struggling with his short game. You know, he can still hit the long ball like crazy, but if he doesn't hit the fairways, he's scrambling. And what I saw from him in the U.S. Open and in the Masters is the man could not putt. He was struggling. He had so many birdie opportunities, and he could not make them. And and that's kind of what's going on with Rory McIlroy right now. But I think he'll turn it around for the British Open at St. Andrews. I see him you know, playing that link style course again um, back in, in Europe. I think will bode well from him as he's closer to his home. So... I just have to predict that. I see both of them being great. They'll both be Hall of Fame golfers. Um, I still will not put the. I will say this. I don't think that any of them get as close to Tiger Woods at his 14 majors. I don't see that happening. I'd maybe maybe 10, 11 tops yeah. for Rory 
and, and a couple behind for Jordan Spieth when their careers are said and done. But uh, they're, the torch is passed to them, Red. That's what I predict. Now I want a prediction from you. What do you think? It's your, a tough one. Your boy Rory or Jordan Spieth um, at the end of their careers? You know, I'm going to have to agree with you, Kyle, even though I didn't, I didn't want to give a definite answer on this. Oh, um, glad. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree. Why? Uh, you know, I'm a Rory McIlroy fan, first of all. But, you know, Rory, as you said, he can run away. He can run away with it. He's got – he's basically got one issue right now, and that's his putting game. Yeah. Um, he's just got to work on that. And tell you what, it can go up and down like a carousel, up and down. Put the quarter in, round. Yes. Exactly, exactly. Well, you know, here, here's – got- before, just before you go on so we can put this into perspective, right now on tour – his putting, he's ranked 67th. That's oh, great. He's, he's struggling. But how about this? Driving distance, ranked 9th. How about T to green, ranked 1st. Uh, Eagles, 6th. Strokes gain, 1st. So he's up there on other stats, but his putting is back there. That's what's holding yes. him back. Continue. And you know, this, this thing with Jordan Spieth right now, you can have a great year and then you can fall back. Yep. I mean, just, seen it just look at everyone. Just look at Rory right now. He's having a bad. He's having a bad moment, and it's really just: can you recover from having a bad year? Exactly. That's the question. Because that's what the greats do. Tiger Woods yes. has done it before. He could do it again, which maybe will be a sneak peek segment. Sneak peek preview sneak segment. Freak. That's right, Rhett. Sneak peek, but a potential future. Will there be a Tiger Woods comeback segment? I like it, uh, but. You, I agree with you. Continue on. You're making a great point about it with the, what the greats do. You know, it, it's just can Jordan Spieth do that if he falls back next year or in future? Uh, can Rory McIlroy do that? You know, I can see both of them doing that. You know, both are just phenomenal golfers. They are. And, you know, my preference is, you know, is Rory McIlroy. He's my number one golfer. And, you know, Jordan Spieth, he's not too far behind. I love watching both of them play. It's just phenomenal. And I, I can see that from both of them. It's just, can you turn it around when times get tough? And, you know, Tiger Woods has done that before. I don't think he'll be able to do it again, that's for sure. But it just comes down to that. And my opinion, Rory McIlroy will have more. But I can tell you right now, Jordan Spieth will not be far behind. Hey, absolutely. And right now, and I can, I can, I can appreciate that. Do you agree with the 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 number I threw out there that about ten or eleven major wins for Roy yeah, McIlroy? Yeah. Ten or eleven, I can see that. Um, hopefully, he gets more than that. I wouldn't mind seeing him get up there with the old <laughs> dagger. <Yes. laughs> but I, I, I don't really think it's going to happen. Unless, you know, he gets on a nice little fiery streak for the next few years. But, uh, but yeah, I, I would love to see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I, so, I would too. Yeah. And and right now, total putting, Jordan Spieth is ranked 38th in the world. So, and not to mention, not just that, but right now, driving distance, he's ranked 72nd. He doesn't drive the ball all that far. Uh, yeah. And, and accuracy, 83rd. So his numbers, Rhett, aren't all there when you look at that. And and to me, it's like, okay, it just shows. And total putting, again, ranked 60th is what Rory McIlroy's ranked. Um, but his numbers are better in the other categories with driving. Uh, I mean, that's impressive. So it just goes to show it's more than stats. The mental game is really huge. And any, if, if there's anything we know about the game of golf, right, it can change with one swing of the golf club. You're yeah, and you around. know that by experience. Absolutely. Me, too often lately, but hopefully that hey, that changes. You can, you can turn it around. Be like the greats. That's right. Hey, that's what I hope. That's what you I know, hope. You, anybody can have a bad round, and that's it can right. turn it into something bad the rest of the year. Hey, Just very true. What very type true. of player can turn it around? Hey, absolutely true, Rhett. Well, let's get into this next segment here. And let's chat about a guy that you may or may not hate. A lot of people do. A lot of people don't. The name's Christian Leitner. Do you hate him? Do you not? Rhett, what do you do with this guy? Well, you know, you think I, was, this guy? I was actually – I grew up watching Duke. You know, my That's family's a big 
my family's a big Duke fan. Um, but I'll tell you what, I love Christian Leitner. I am one of those people that would wear the shirt just like in the 30 for 30. <laughs> I love Christian Leitner. That's a great 30 for 30 film, by the way, it's folks. Probably hands it, down one of the best 30 for 30s I've seen. Right behind other than Reggie, Reggie Medler. Yes. You know, I was, I was going to say that. Um, but he is, he was a phenomenal player. People, people can say that, you know, he was the rich boy, the pretty boy that, you know, got his way, which, you know, he is, he is, but that doesn't take away from the game of basketball that he played very, very well. You know, you could think of the same thing about, um, Reggie Miller. You know, he got his way. He did what he wanted and that didn't stop him. So, you know, I think that the type of player he was, and just because he played for Duke, if he would have went and played anywhere else, I think it, would, it wouldn't even been a problem. Um, but, boy, did I love him. You know, the pretty boy attitude, you know, stepping on, it was it Timberlake, I believe, stepping on him once, trying to make a statement. You know, that's, that's the type of basketball, a little rough and tough and gritty basketball. Try and get into people's heads, and that's what I like. And, you know, he knew how to play it, and he, just like Reggie, would get into people's skin, and I like it. I've got three words followed by four words. Puke on Duke, I hate Christian Leitner. Oh, my God. Let me tell you about this guy. Here's why. I can't stand Duke. Never have, never will. And I agree with you. The fact that he played on Duke made a difference in a lot of people's eyes. He played for on a team where they have arguably the greatest rivalry in all the sports with Duke and North Carolina. And they duked it out, pun intended. But <laughs> the thing is, I thought I, – I, I like the edge that he had. I'll agree with that. But I have to put it there – because he played for Duke, and I thought he was too dirty of a player. He, oh, I think coming he, from the guy that loves Delhi, Matthew oh Delavadova. They they don't rank anywhere close. Christian Leitner, he, yeah, he, he Christian Leitner was good. a dirty player. Uh, he he just was. He got under people's skins. He played for Duke. He ha- he held that image. He was co- He was cocky. He had the looks and everything, and, and, and it just added. It was just one of those athletes that you could look at and be like, wow, man, I hope somebody would just sock him in the face. I mean, basically, that's what it was. I'm glad that I uh, wasn't old enough to be able to, to witness him playing and have to look at the highlights now in the footage from back then because uh, I wouldn't have been able to stand them. Uh, and, and now it's like I can relate to the people who still can't stand them, especially if they weren't a Duke fan. Uh, the people who who watched him and thought, "Wow, this who's this guy think he is?" Uh, but but the bottom line is, and this can't be denied. And and if it if if it was, it's North Carolina fans, and you know they're a little salty or whatever it may be. But the man Don't has the phenomenal stat. He is one of the greatest college basketball players of all time. And he has the stats to back it up. He is clutch. He has probably, I don't think anybody will forget it, the most dramatic clutch shot in the history of the NCAA basketball. And that would be his turnaround jump shot against Kentucky. Uh, Unbelievable. Basically, he's the only player to start in four consecutive Final Fours. uh, And he helped them win two national championships. So... It's hard to argue with those stats in college. He was a great player. I'm going to go over uh, some of the stats that he had at Duke. Played all four years there. He In his career, he averaged 16.6. Not outstanding, but he did improve each year. First year, 8.9. Second year, 16. Third year, almost 20. Fourth year, almost 22. Uh he, I mean, let's face it, he's a freak athlete, all right? He averaged in his last year um, almost eight rebounds per game. Uh, he averaged a block per game. Two national championships. I mean, 
he had a clutch career at Duke. There's 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 no doubt about it. He I mean, he was like Reggie Miller. You want the ball in his hands because he's going to hit the shot. He was a center that could extend the floor and, and drain threes. I mean, he literally could do everything um, in college. Now, the NBA was a different story, and it just goes to show how there can be great college basketball players, but then when you get to the NBA, it's a different league, and you can fall over, fall out. Now, he had some problems off the court, and I think that affected his NBA career with the decisions he made. But, nonetheless, he did still play a decently long career in the NBA. He hung around the NBA his whole career. He played 15 years in the NBA between six different teams. Started out with the Timberwolves, where he was drafted. Then the Wizards, then the Hawks, the Pistons, the Mavericks, the Heat. So he was all over the place, but you know, his career his career numbers, they weren't terrible, about 13 points per game, but nowhere near what he was in college. Uh, and I think a lot of it had to do with the teams he played on that weren't good. It also had to do with the decisions he made. But he you know, a lot of players can't say they made it to the league and and, and they hung around for 15 years. Uh, that's pretty impressive, Rhett. But nonetheless, one of the greatest college basketball oh. players of all time. Oh yeah, definitely agree. Um, one of my favorites. To, one of my favorites to watch. But um, when it comes to when it comes to him in college, he was just a phenomenal player, like you said, in the Kentucky, in the game winner in Kentucky. He had that turnaround jumper to win the game. Kentucky thought that they won the game. They thought that they were they thought they were moving on and winning it all. But guess what? When you play against Christian Leitner, that is not the case. He came in clutch and as you could see on that documentary, which was hilarious, the Kentucky fan thought they won. He was he was laughing, giggling, telling jokes. And then when Christian Leitner hit that shot, he just freaked out. He freaked out. It was hilarious. I loved it. And if you have not seen the 30 for 30, I hate Christian Leitner, go watch it now because it is, it is fantastic. One of the best that I've seen and one of the best that we'll probably probably see. Um, but, yeah, he was a fantastic player, Kyle. And... He was one that you know did not transition into the NBA as good as you would expect. He had the um, he had he had off court issues. You know he had the marijuana issue, and um, you know it's it's not not something that he's proud of. But everybody makes mistakes, like he said. Very true. So, but yeah, it's a. Uh... It's hard to argue with it. I couldn't stand them, uh, but basically that's how it goes. Uh, you you loved them. I didn't. Hey, it's all right, right? It's okay. Yeah. Well, all right. let's get into this next segment here, Rhett, our last segment. This will be an interesting one. We're going to talk about the NBA draft. That's what we're going to talk about uh, because it happened Thursday night. Just a few days ago, and you know what? Boy, was it an interesting NBA draft, to say the least. A loaded NBA draft as well. And I want to talk about the winners and losers in this draft. Specifically, I want to start with our Indiana Pacers. With the 11th pick in the 2015 NBA draft. The Indiana Pacers selected Miles Turner from the University of Texas. And boy, did I like this pick. At first, I didn't. You know why? Because I wanted Frank the Tank Kaminsky. But it didn't happen because he got drafted a couple spots earlier to the Charlotte Hornets. So the Pacers took Miles Turner, a guy who I think was a better option than Willie Cauley-Stein, Trey Lyles, the other players that were right there, Stanley Johnson. I like it. The man 
had a good freshman year at Texas. And do I think he will be a Reggie Miller 11th pick? No. Those don't come around very often. But I see him being a player that will have a solid career for the Indiana Pacers. Uh, it was an 11th pick that I wasn't hot on at first. Oh, yeah. But I will say this. It's mainly because he's so young, and I want to see him develop more. He had mediocre stats at Texas, um, but he also is a big man that can extend his play on offense and step out and shoot the three, and he's a great defender, which is what the Indiana Pacers need. Great on defense, can block shots like crazy, is lengthy like you, Rhett, like a tree. Uh so I loved that 11th pick. As we're talking about the NBA draft here, I started off, Rhett, with the Pacers, our Pacers, and their 11th pick. What do you think about the Pacers taking Miles Turner? I love it. I love it. You know, I was, you know, he was in my top, uh, I believe, top four. Um, and, you know, I thought he was going to be a good one. You know, I wanted, I was, you know, you got me on that, that freaking Frank the Tank Kaminsky uh, little thing. Yeah, I mentioned him. Uh, I hopped up on that. He got snagged. Oh. Yeah, he got snagged. They couldn't pick him up. So, you know, my second option was Miles Turner. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad with our pick. I am like it. I think he's going to be good. Now, I, I can't say that he needs a haircut because that is just awful. <laughs> that is an awful haircut. Yeah, I don't but, like uh, it. Yeah, sure don't either. So... You know, if he's, you know, he's he might be young, but look at all these young players that have been young and turned out great in the NBA. Yeah. So, you know, you can't you can't really say something on somebody's age. Age is just a number. It's about how they they act and how they they dedicate their time to the sport. So, you know, Kyle, you don't want anybody looking down on you because of your age. And, you know, he doesn't want anybody looking down on him because of his age. It's how he acts and how he can react to that. So And how he plays because age is a factor because he's young. And if he's not what people expect him to be, then the, then that that's the issue right there. I don't expect him to be much this first, this first year. I think that it's going to be a building process this first year. And I think this second year he's going to. He's going to be something. Uh, he's going to be something special. I'm not going to say he's going to be some type of Dwight, but I'm going to be. I'm going to say that he's going to be something special. And that's what I Indiana hope Pacers. he will be. I, I. It just makes me nervous because he's so young, and he played one year in college. And making that transition, you know, a lot of players can't do it. We just yeah. got done talking about Christian Leitner, one of the greatest college basketball players ever. I mean, it happens, and that's why young age is a factor. I mean, all of these guys are young. It's it's finding the right one that'll pan out, and it just it just makes me nervous that it, is he it or is he not? It's just time time will tell. I hope that he is. Uh, it just I have to I have to be proven that he is at the eleventh pick. That's that's what it is for me. But but it is worth mentioning as we're going to talk about winners and losers. I started with the our Pacers, and that's mainly because I think the Pacers were winners. You know, again, they weren't the on, biggest winners, but it no on iffy on the pick again. But he has the talent, and I think he has the potential to be something. Just prove it. But their second round pick, Joseph Young, point guard from Oregon, what a steal for the Pacers. I mean, the Pacers played this draft exactly like they needed to, getting a big man in the first round, getting a guard in the second round. I think that they won exactly what they needed to do, Rhett. They did, they did exactly what they, they needed to do, so I think they are winners in this draft. It's not just the bias in there. I truly think they made great picks uh, where yes. they stood. And so I'm putting them in there as one of the winners. What about you? Yeah, I, I loved that second round pick. What a fantastic player. He he's a lights out scorer when he played for Oregon and he knows how to create shots for himself because he's an undersized guard. He he plays with a chip on his shoulder and that's what the Indiana Pacers need. That's exactly so, right. Yeah. So I you know that I I agree that they do have a great a great pick on their hands there. All right. But well, uh, I winner. think that my number one winner is I think the Miami Heat. Picking up Justice Winslow. 
you know, I think that's a, a fantastic pick. What a sleeper pick. This guy fell back to the 10th pick, and they were able to get him. You got to know Pat Riley is just doing dances behind the scenes. You know, fantastic pick, especially if you got Dwayne Wade leaving. And that's a that's another time. Well, not to mention that Josh Richardson was picked 40th for them, and he had a solid career at Tennessee, where he yes. averaged about 18 points per game, and he's a six foot six shooting guard. That's uh, a great pick. Yeah, that, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. They're not my number one winner, um, and I and I didn't even rank them. I I was just going, all right. Here's some teams I thought who who won, and some that didn't. Um, yeah. I would have yeah. them as a winner as well with the Pacers. I also would I have would. The, the Lakers as a winner. Um, I think it'd be hard to argue with the fact that they got maybe the best passer in the game at number two, D'Angelo Russell, since Magic the Magic Johnson. Uh, that is a very, very accurate and respectful comparison that they are making in that Lakers yeah. organization. Because, I wouldn't say that they're a winner. D'Angelo Russell... I have never seen a guy that can pass the ball like he can since yeah. Magic Johnson, and I've never seen a guy who can score like he can. And it's it's incredible. So that they right there they were a winner to me getting D'Angelo Russell at number number two, but yeah, then they well, got Larry Nance Jr. at twenty seven, and they got <laughs> Anthony Brown at thirty four. Larry um, Nance Jr. They they know that they, I I think that they knew what they were doing. And they studied it long and hard, and I think for the simple fact of uh, they got D'Angelo Russell, that's going to help that Lakers team along with the offseason moves. So I think they were a winner in the draft. Y- you don't agree, though, though. Oh, well, no, I, I think that he's a fantastic pick, but I, I calling them a winner because they got the second pick, that uh, I don't really think that that's considered. You know, they're expected to get a winner. Uh, I would hope they'd get a winner. You know, if they would have they picked that guy out of Europe, then – Oh my gosh. But, um, you know, I would expect what a fantastic pick. I mean, he was expected to go second or third and, you know, comparing to magic. I mean, that he's a great, he's a phenomenal passer and he can score, uh, him alongside Kobe Bryant. I think is, you know, Kobe Bryant is going to have some of the weight taken off his shoulders here. You know, he is getting older and he needs some help around the, on the team. And I think that they're going to have a great team this year. And D'Angelo Russell, he is going to be a great contributor. Yeah, immediately. He's one of those. Yes. He's one of those few players from college that played one year and will come to the NBA and make an immediate rookie impact. Yes, just he, like uh, Victor Oladipo did, and and he wasn't even a you know he was a junior at IU. So uh, I, he will make an immediate impact as a rookie. Um, I just I watched a lot of D'Angelo Russell, unfortunately playing for Ohio State in the Big Ten, and he could do everything. Average about 20 points per game, but the man made passes that I seriously have not seen since Magic Johnson, and he could score. He's, he's an amazing two-way player. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's impressive what he's done, uh, but right. I did have them as a winner. Uh, I also yeah, yeah. I don't know about this one. Uh, I, I saw a lot of people have the Knicks as winners. But uh, the thing with that is I don't know much about this Kristaps Porzingis. But, and that's who they picked at number four. A lot of fans weren't happy about it. Uh, Euro guys, it's kind of a, oh boy, wild card. Wait and see. Because a lot of them don't pan out that are picked that high in the first round. But they got Jerry and Grant from Washington. And I think that was the biggest win for them. Uh, they also got a guy named Guillermo Hernangomez from Philadelphia at 35. So basically, you know, he had great stats, this poor Zaginis, but let's see how it transitions to the NBA. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a different type of league you're playing with over there. That's for sure. I mean, you got, you got smaller guys. Um, you don't have that type of physicality as you do in the NBA. It's a different ball league. It's like going up from uh, it's like playing high school basketball and then jumping into the NBA. It's a total different type of league, in my opinion. You can give your own opinion on that, but that's that's where I stand on that. Hey, that's all right. Do you have any other winners before we get to the losers? Um, yes, I do have one more, and that would be the Denver Nuggets. 
The Denver Nuggets. You know, they got Emmanuel Mude, number seventh. That, that's, that's, that's a pretty good pick. You know, he wasn't expected to fall back a few spots, but he did. And, you know, he's a Dwayne Wade type of player. He's crafty. I think he's going to make an immediate impact. Like Ty Lawson said, Ty Lawson's gone. Ty Lawson's gone. They got a new superstar in there that's going to take over. Huh. And, you know, I would like to uh, – we're going to get to this soon, but our our we're going to make a prediction of the rookie of the year for this upcoming, upcoming <laughs> season. And okay. be prepared for that, Kyle. I can but, do it. But uh, we can get on to our, our losers. All right. And well, for me, it's very clear. Uh, I, I think this is a hands-down loser. Uh, the Atlanta Hawks are the number one loser. They trade. They, not only were they the number one team in the Eastern Conference this year, they had a, the 15th pick in the NBA draft, which they decided to trade to save money. And And what did they get? They got a 50th pick in Marcus Erickson, and they got a 59th pick in Demetrius Argavanis, going with a Euro guy. Uh, they're not even expected to play in the United States for them yeah, this well, next year. Terrible draft for uh, the Atlanta Hawks. That's my number one loser. They Well, they also traded for Tim Hardaway Jr. I think that He's Tim Hardaway Jr. Oh, I, I, don't I like wouldn't. Him. I don't. Think uh, I he's wouldn't good. say that. You know, I think that he's he's going to be pretty good. Um, I like him. He's mediocre at best. Uh, you know, he, he can be good. I can see it. I think he has some potential. Um, I he's don't see trading. He's up and down like a teeter totter. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> um, I wouldn't say that he's worth a fifteenth pick trade. Uh, that's for sure. Especially in this but, loaded draft. Yeah, I mean, I would not say that, but um. I would agree with you on that, Kyle. I would agree on that. Now, I would like to touch on the my the next one that I think is a loser, and that is the Detroit Pistons. Yeah, they didn't do great either. Stanley Johnson. I had them there next. Uh, you know, it's something that you, you passed up on Justice Winslow. Uh, that that would have been a much better option than Stanley Johnson. You know, I don't really know if he's going to pan out. He was he's a good. Incons- he's a good player. He's I an inconsistent quite a bit of shooter, uh, in he my opinion. He can do it all. He can do it all. He can, but will but, it pan uh, out from college? Yeah, that's, and that's the a big question. question. That's a big question. I think um, it will. I think that he'll be a. I don't know if he'll. I don't think he'll be a, a star like he was in college. But I think that he'll be at least an average player. Uh, but when you look at them, you know, you want more than an average player when you get a top 10 pick. Yeah, exactly. And, um, I would like to, you're going to, you're probably going to go a little, a little insane on this one, Kyle, but I'd like to throw it out there. They have on us today, the Charlotte Hornets, 27th worst picked in the NBA draft. So they think they were losers. Yes, they think Frank Kaminsky was a bad pick. And I'm going to disagree with them and say that's an asinine statement. <laughs> well, you know, I, I mean, you know, they do have a, they do have a, um, I mean, they do have a pretty good argument right here. Um, soft shooting big man. He's going to pose some problems. He's going to pose quite a bit of matchup nightmares. Um, and they thought he was a little too high for the type of player that he is going he ninth NBA draft. He was. Uh, I will comment I, on that since I you will brought expect, her up. I will expect him to. Go, I, I expected him to go after the tenth pick at least, but that didn't happen. But, I you did. know. I, I I can see him being a pretty decent player in the NBA. You know, I don't think he's going to be fantastic, but I can see him being pretty good. I. Right. He's going to be fantastic. Oh, Frank wow. Kaminsky. I I already mentioned it at the start of this segment. I I was hoping he was going to be picked by the Indiana Pacers, but he got snagged up in the top ten by the Hornets, and I thought he would. Uh, I thought he was going to go in the top ten, and I think it's well-deserved. Uh, I don't know who wrote that on Frank Kaminsky, but um, my guess is they didn't watch quite a bit of him this last year. He is a guy Scott he, he is a guy who um, I don't know what he means, what that man means by soft shooting. Uh, he may be able to extend the floor more than anybody as a big man. 
led the team in three point shooting uh, this past year. He can he can do everything. His post game's incredible for his size. The only thing I see in Frank Kaminsky is he needs to get stronger. Uh, but he's not afraid of anyone, and he still can back plenty of people down because he's a monster in size. Uh, but he can do it all. He's a great free throw shooter. He's a great defender. Uh, and I already mentioned it. He's a great shooter. Uh, I, I definitely would disagree with that. I think he will be a star in this league, and, and I think he'll make an immediate impact. There's no doubt about it in my mind. So, yeah, I definitely disagree with that. Would not call them losers in the draft. I, I'd, call, I'd lean them more towards winners because of that pick. But, yeah, other than that, you know, the biggest thing is, Rhett, that the Indiana Pacers did well. That's what mm-hmm. we love. And before you uh, – if I guess before we answer that question you had, do you have any other losers? Uh, no, those were my, those were my top losers. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I have one more loser, and that is the Sacramento Kings. Willie Colley Steins. I think that was just an awful pick. What kind of moron would pick Willie Colley Steins at the sixth pick? Uh, that was, that don't think high. that he's going to pan out. You know, they have him compared to Dennis Rodman, my butt. I um, think it's pathetic. He's not going to transition well into the NBA. But Yeah, I do agree with that. I think That is my opinion. High. I think he went too high. I'd call them losers, too, with that sixth pick. Uh I, I don't see him being a star in the league. I don't I don't see him being a player that will transition because he just doesn't have it offensively. Uh, he he will be a great defender. That is true, but I don't think that'll be enough. And he needs to he needs to talk about a guy who needs to bulk up. That's Willie Colley Stein. Um, basically, is a mirror image of Red. Uh, that's it, it's a guy who I, I agree I, I would I would maybe call them losers because of that pick I, too high did you just say I'm bad at offense no I said you're skinny oh uh, right. basically gone. we're gonna agree on that one but I like your question here as we wrap the show up who do you think will be rookie of the year Rhett? I think will be rookie of the year is D'Angelo Russell well we're in agreement it's perfect. I think that he, you know, he's a phenomenal player. I think he's going to be, he's going to be something. And um, I, you know, we didn't point out in the in the point out in the show. Did you see what he was wearing in yes. the draft? Yeah, he went. He was what a, a loud. phenomenal suit. Holy cow, that is fantastic. I yeah. loved it. I I agree. He will be a guy. I think he will be rookie of the year. He will be a phenomenal player in the NBA. He he just has all the tools. He's he's a guy where you can just tell and was truly ready after the first year in college to go to the NBA. And I think he'll make an immediate impact on a Lakers team who was pathetic last year and is right. looking to turn it around. Uh, and this Lakers team's going to turn it around. When yeah, they're going to have a healthy Kobe back, and they're going to make some moves in the off season. So they're definitely winners yeah. to me in the draft in my mind. He's, he's definitely like the WD forty uh, spraying on the hinge for the. For the Lakers, loosen it up. He, he's going to loosen them up. He's going to loosen them up, and he's going to he's going to swing that door wide open for them. That's for sure. And that's what they need. That's what they need. So I think we're in complete agreement there, Rhett. And just like that, our here sports show is over, and we went over again, Rhett. Uh, but you know what? Isn't it amazing? It's like a movie. It's same thing. When we get talking about sports, we can lose track of time. Exactly. Because exactly. we have so much great sports talk in these segments. and Hashtag great sports. Great sports talk. talk. That's right. Absolutely. Yes. Always. To recap mm-hmm. what was talked about on the show, we discussed the top five quarterbacks in the NFL. We talked about the PGA Tour, anchored putters, Roy McIlroy and Jordan Spieth and all. We discussed Christian Leitner, and we chatted about the NBA draft. That is all that we have for today. Thank you for tuning in to our show. Feel free to leave feedback as we want to be able to address comments and questions on the show. Tweet and retweet the show at Kyle M. Newman, at Rhett Hensley, and at Indiana Pacers Talk. We will be back at it next Monday by 8 Eastern Time. I'm Kyle Newman. And I'm Rhett Hensley. You have a great rest of the day. And go sports. Go sports.